Uh, welcome back, everybody. Today, we are going to talk about Jeff Browning's win at Sedona Canyons 125 and then Mike McKnight's win at Cocodona 250. And then we're going to go over recovery because um, they both recovered really well. Both have been running since the race. So, um, yeah. How are you guys feeling today? It's, what, two weeks out or so from from your wins? Yeah, I feel good. Yeah. Um, just got out of the canyon for two days. As you know, Derek, you were with me. Um, we spent two big, huge days, 57 miles in two days in the canyon with about 11,000 feet of climbing, um, in with heat too. So, um, and that was, you know, we started that first big training day, a 33 mile day with just exactly two weeks after I finished, uh, the 125. Um, and I have bighorn 100 in less than four weeks and about three and a half weeks. So, um, I kind of got back on it. I had friends coming to town to go to the Canyon and, um, and yeah, I feel good. I'm, I'm back. So yeah. Cool. How about you, Mike? Uh, I feel pretty good. I haven't had no 33 mile run in the Grand Canyon though. Um, cause my <laughs> coach hasn't scheduled that for me. <laughs> um, yeah, I have not. I'm, I'm being a little more conservative with Mike <laughs> than myself. Yeah. I tend to go a little too hard after these things. Um, but I mean, I've done a lot of strength training. Uh, I, like I got back on a Sunday night and I've essentially strength trained, um, Jeff might be learning about this right now, but I have been strength training essentially every day since I've been back. And, um, I took a full week off from running, but, uh, I felt really good during it. And I kind of had to like convince myself to take that full week off. And then all my runs ever since have been about an hour to an hour and 20 and they've all felt really good. So recovery is going as perfect as it could be, to be honest. I, I, I'll let me chime in here too. I, I took a week off as well, um, from running. I didn't run for a week. Um, so I, same as Mike, I, I didn't run. I think that's an important thing after these big races, a lot of people want to, you know, feel like they want to get back on it or they're going to lose fitness or something, but you know, in one week, you're not really going to lose anything and you're going to gain a lot more by resting the legs. Um, I, but I did strength training, um, soon, just like Mike, I was in the weight room quite a bit and I've been in the weight room quite a bit the last week. Um, not every day, but and I don't mind every day if Mike's in there every day, I, it's not a big deal. He's not doing like mega heavy, um, weight or anything, but I think restoring range of motion and restoring, uh, um, just movement patterns is a really important piece after these big races. Cause you get so tight from the, the repetitive movement pattern that you're in during the race. So, uh, yeah, I, I kind of, if, if, if done the same thing. I just jumped back into a long run because I had friends come to town and, um, and I ended up, you know, I was, I have to admit two weeks after I normally would not do two big days in the Canyon, but with friends coming to town, I, I definitely, um, was a little conservative the first day just in my pace and running downhill. And, but by the end of the run, I was like, man, I'm feel great. And, same thing the second day felt amazing the second day and we didn't hammer or anything we did push on the climb out both days i pushed the climb out of the canyon just because i felt good um but it was at the end of the workout so anyway yeah i guess before we jump into like recovery and like everything you guys did to recover from like those two big events maybe we should talk about like in race i don't know maybe this is just on my mind because we were talking about this at the canyon last week jeff of like I like historically I've always just blown up at events, then my recovery sucks and all these different things. And like this is why it's on on my mind right now, anyways. And maybe other people have had similar experiences. And it's kind of like a duh thing. Like if you go out super hard and blow up, obviously your recovery is gonna suck because you push your body to the absolute limit and just crumble. But like yeah. you guys both finished um your 125 and the 250 really strong. So like during race, and I guess even like the morning of, like, what did you do to like have a solid, consistent race nutritionally and pacing wise? And then how did that play out during the race? And then, then I guess affect your recovery post race. Well, Mike's is going to be different than mine because he, <laughs> he had an epiphany with raw milk, um, <laughs> which I understand, but, uh, I, I think, um, uh, for me personally, I did what I always, what I normally do. And one of the things I've been playing around with the last year and a half or so, um, is, uh, actually, uh, fasting on race morning. So not just having my normal, like coffee and cream and, um, 
and you know maybe a, a glass of relight, but no calories, just um, just a Vespa right before the race, and um, and then IV drip of calories during the race. So for me, it's just carb calories in a liquid form with my electrolytes mixed in. So I'm always drinking the exact amount of sodium per liter. I've been tested with the precision hydration test. So that test has really, uh, that, that test has really, uh, um, um, given me some insight and my athletes insight into, you know, everyone's very unique in how much sodium they dump in their sweat per liter of sweat and replenishing that number at about a 90% rate, you know, about 90% of that number is a really kind of important strategy to really fine tune race hydration. Um, and, and you know that more than anyone, Derek, because you recently had the test and you've seen the results in the Canyon when it's hot. And that's where it really shows up because you have to climb out and, you know, with a big climb and it really, everyone, if they don't have their sodium per liter di dialed in, in the Canyon, everybody craters on the climb out, um, at the end of a big run, cause you're coming out of the heat climbing up a big giant climb, you know, 4,500 or almost 5,000 foot climb at the end of a long run. It's a really easy way to crater. And so I think getting that kind of dialed is really important piece for me personally. Um, it's a really important piece of just, you know, everything for lack of a better term, all cylinders firing in the motor um, during that you know, during a race. So I, I, that's one thing I do. And I, I, I don't worry about, um, you know, eating a big breakfast. I eat light the day before. Um, I don't eat a lot of, I eat carbs, but I don't eat a ton of carbs. I just eat potatoes and usually one piece of fruit the day before and a lot of like lighter meat. So a lot of animal products, so eggs, fish and chicken the day before I eat a big steak, two days out <laughs> steak and potatoes, um, two days out, like a big ribeye or something. But, um, I really eat light the day before the race and then, um, and then start the race on fasted and that helps with GI, um, overall. So I'm not having to try to feel, figure out digest. My body's not trying to digest while I'm running because it's already worked it through. Um, so that's kind of my approach. And then I just stay on it the whole race and, and don't get lazy with my, my calories intake and my, and my hydration. Yeah. Cause you had salmon the night before up in Jerome, right? Yeah. I had salmon and I had chicken for lunch. So I think skin on the bone, uh, thighs for lunch. Um, it was a benefit of being so close for Sedona canyons, you know, Jerome's only an hour and hour and a half away or so. From my house so we ate lunch at my house and it made chicken thighs on the Traeger um and uh and had eggs that morning for breakfast but that was kind of my my day you know yeah did your <clears throat> i'm curious to know did this strategy change for moab jeff um specifically the fasting the morning of the race um, I did eat a few eggs the morning of Moab just because you're, it's a, you're running slower in a, in a 200 than you are in a hundred, but in hundreds, I'm, you're usually running kind of, you're running at a faster pace in a hundred miler. Um, at least I am compared to 200. So I, I, I did eat a little bit because I knew I was like, okay, I'm, I'm stepping, it was my first 200. So I'm stepping off into, you know, uh, 60 potentially 60 plus hours with just whatever you know with race nutrition and a little bit of food and during the race and i i didn't know what my body i guess i was i knew i would be going slower so i knew i, I wouldn't have as much issue with digesting so that's that, that was a difference but but in all the hundreds and 50 k's and 50 milers i've done this spring i've been messing around with fasting the morning of the race um just from a digestion perspective, right? So then you're not, I guess more than anything, we're, I'm trying to avoid a, you know, an early bowel movement during the race. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's really what it's about. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> I figured the strategy changed between 200s and 100s, but I just wanted to check. Yeah, that's a good, good. Thanks for clarifying that because, yeah. or making me clarify that. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, yeah, do you have any so other What about you, Mike? Yeah, what did you do the morning of? 
Um, you rushed around and forgot yeah. your electrolytes the first 33 miles and barely made it to the start. I forgot my bladder before I, yeah, it was a mess, dude. Um, that's what happens when you wake up at 3 a.m. to go to a race. Uh, uh, so for me, it's very similar to you, Jeff, in terms of like what I ate the day before and a couple of days before. Um, I did a steak two nights before, and then the night before was a bunch of chicken. Um, so a little bit of a leaner protein. And then something that I experimented with this race was um, kind of what we learned in a podcast that we did with Zach Bitter, or maybe it was Michelle Hearn. It was one of the two, but um, somebody told us how Zach tends to implement or introduce more processed carbohydrates into his diet a week or two before the race. And so the week before Cocodona, I started having stuff like, um, like a grain-free granola that you can get from natural grocers and then, uh, Siete potato chips, Siete tortilla chips. Um, and then just like getting my gut used to those processed foods again. Um, usually though, before a race, I'll do like a strict keto reset. That's something that Jeff taught me when I started working with him a while ago, but I don't know if I did that this time around. Um, I just kind of kept my carbohydrates between 100 and 150 grams, like consistently leading into it, mostly in the form of fruit. Um, and I, I don't feel like that affected my ability to burn fat for fuel. I mean, it's such a long event. So like, <laughs> you know, you're going to dip into that pretty quickly, right? Yeah, you're not exactly. going to, it's not going to affect you. That's the one yeah. thing with OFM that we've, we've, we've kind of like all been tinkering with for years and years now. You can have 100 to 150 grams of carbs in a day and not really knock yourself out of like low level ketosis. Um, this was a big discussion point that Derek and I were having over the weekend um, on, on ketose on ketones. Cause we, we had a lot of discussion on, on exogenous ketones and natural ketones. And I think the, that, that, you know, when we're training regularly, we're not really knocking ourselves out of ketosis. And if we do, it's only for a short amount of time. And then it's back right back in within a 15 hour within 15 hours of sleeping overnight and a slight fast, you're back in really quickly. And most of us fast in the morning a little bit, you know, just for a short window. Like I haven't had any breakfast this morning yet. I'm just having bulletproof coffee and I'll eat, eat eggs mid morning, but you know, from dinner last night, I'm probably going to be, have a 15 hour fast, you know, with bulletproof yeah. coffee in there, but and I mean, for me too, like I, I woke up this morning and I did a strength training routine just before this. And just to get a little bit of protein before coming down here, I had like a cup of raw milk with creatine and some bone broth. So, I mean, it was pretty low key in terms of carbohydrates, a lot of fat, a lot of protein and fairly low in calories too. You're thinking right. um, just of the protein thing and the bone broth. Like I know like soup is always a big thing at like longer events because of the sodium content. But, um, and Mike, I don't know if you did this, but Jeff, you had bone broth during the race. Do you think there was, you think there's any sort of, um, almost like pre recovery, recovery effect of having like collagen and protein during a longer event? I'm sure it helps. I mean, I don't know. I don't have any data on that, but, um, it always, it always sounds good and it always tastes good. And, you know, and I don't do whatever the race has. I always, I bring my own. Um, and my crew, I do kettle, kettle and fire bone broth. And I add re Redmond real salt to it. And we put it into like a Stanley thermos. So just like an old school, you know, good thermos. And then once they've heated it, they heat it up when we go into evening, we go into night. And that's when I start consuming bone broth. Um, and we had mashed potatoes. So like mashed potatoes with a little butter and Redmond real salt, you know, um, we made the night before, put it in Tupperware, it goes in a cooler, um, and then I just eat, eat a little here and there, eat here and there, um, when I see crew and then I have bone broth at night, they heat it up once, put it in the, in the thermos. And then I sip on it all night. And it's funny. I always, I always, I don't even think about it coming in for like, Oh, I really want bone broth. But as soon as I see it, I'm like, Oh yeah, I want some of that. And it always tastes really, really good. Like I never, like, I never don't drink it, I guess. Even yeah. at, even in like Moab when, you know, for 57 hours, like I always, the bone broth always sounded good. Yeah. And what's funny or not funny, but just interesting is that stuff's super easy to make too. Like you just do like one hour of prep the day before and you have your mashed potatoes and you have your, like your collagen bone broth and stuff. And it's not like you have to spend all this time during the day for your crew to make it. Like it's already done and you have a higher quality source of sodium and protein and carbohydrates. 
Yeah, with no junk in the bone broth, because a lot of the broths at aid stations are cheap and have a lot of like, you know, uh, like processed fillers in in them that you're just, you know, you're consuming a, a list of ingredients that probably causes a little GI stress, you know, frankly. Um, but I, I luckily have a soybean allergy. So, and I, I, I see it as a blessing because it's made me have to come up with my own foods and I can't rely on aid stations because I don't know that there's soy in everything these days, especially if you eat out or you get processed food and there's going to be some kind of cheap soybean filler, soybean oil or something. And so I, I, it's, it's been a blessing for me because then it's made me really fine tune, like the quality of my food. I remember I was at a race. I don't know if you've seen this, but somebody asked if I wanted broth at an aid station. And I said, yeah. And I saw them pull out. It looked like a, um, like almost like a jelly, like Schmucker's jelly squeezy tube thing. Yeah. And they like squeezed out. It looked like jelly. Like it looked absolutely disgusting. And they like squeezed it out into this cup. It was like gooey and nasty. And they just added water and stirred it. And when I saw them, and when I saw that, I just kind of looked at them and said, oh, never mind. I, I don't want that. <laughs> it looked absolutely <laughs> awful. <laughs> Good call. It probably had MSG in it and, yeah. and soybean oil. Yeah. <laughs> It's interesting though. Like I actually had an epiphany before Cocodona. Um, I was walking around and I saw the kettle and fire bone broth, uh, little boxes, cartons. Yeah. And I thought like how I've always wanted soups at these aid stations, but I never end up having them just for similar reasons that Jeff just outlined. And so when I saw those kettle fire and bone broth tubes, I was just like, holy cow, I just need to buy three of these and just use these throughout the race. So this is actually my first race where I bought some bone broth too. Yeah, it's and fire is and perfect. When you put it in the the thermos, the crew, it's really easy for the crew because they just have to heat it up real quick. And I always I I like it extra salty during the race. So I always take like a snack Ziploc and dump the amount of salt I want added to the small box. And I just duct tape it to the outside as a recipe, right? So when the crew knows that they just dump the thing in there, dump the salt in there and heat it up and then dump it into the Stanley thermos and then it's hot and then it's hot for hours and hours all night. And they just, every time we were at a crew spot, they just use the lid as a cup and they just dump some in, put the lid back on. So it's hot and stays hot. And then they're sitting there. It's ready for me to drink when I come in crewing. Got it. Do you know yeah. roughly how much salt you add Jeff? Because bone broth is already pretty salty. Um, I think I add about like to one of those smaller boxes of kettle and fire, I think about a little less than a teaspoon, probably. Oh, okay. Not a ton, but it just, you know, you, when you eat it, when you eat it in normal life, you don't want that much salt, but in a race it salt for me, at least salt always tastes really, really good. And I always want something a little saltier. So I always make it just a touch saltier for the race. So I've kind of played in my kitchen to get it to like, okay, I want about a teaspoon, right? Added to the box Perfect. and then it, and then it's good. <clears throat> that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And it's crazy too, like how fast it is to make. Cause it's like, like you're saying, you just put in a thermos and you're done, but like you can jet boil that in a couple minutes and you have a high quality sodium source versus like you were saying, like just a tube of MSG and who knows what's even in there. It's like chicken flavor. I guarantee you the ingredients list is like two inches long on the side of that package. <laughs> that, all like size two font, point two or whatever. <laughs> well, yeah, there's like no ingredients in the bone broth. There's like chicken bone broth, you know, water and yeah, broth I'm and like, salt. That's it. I'm like 99% sure it was a vegan bone broth. So you know that there's a bunch of... Yeah, it's like 50 ingredients. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, then, so then Mike, yeah, like obviously your raw milk thing is like kind of blown up but um what did you do, do during the race both pace wise and nutritionally wise to kind of maximize recovery yeah i mean i don't want to spend too much time on it because i feel like we did an episode on this a couple of weeks ago right Derek? yeah 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 so i mean i mean like basically like i i was stupid i forgot my electrolytes i fell behind i had a game plan going into it but i had to essentially call an audible and do whatever my stomach could tolerate and um, maybe you have some insight into this, Jeff, but <clears throat> like the entire race, like any kind of solid food, like even gels, as soon as it touched my tongue, I'd start gagging. 
Uh, I only puked once during the whole race because I like tried to force down some, it was like boar's head ham with some cheese in it. And I like really forced that down and I ended up puking it back up. But like, I had to like legit, like, like shove a gel into my mouth in less than like two seconds or else I would have gagged and not been able to swallow it. And so I just had this weird gag reflex. And so I just ended up drinking a bunch of raw milk because liquids were the only thing that I could tolerate without gagging. And, and, you know, there's calories, there's protein, there's fat, there's carbohydrates in raw milk. And so that was kind of my go-to to make sure I had enough energy to get to the finish line. I mean, I don't, I, I mean, thought wise, I, I mean, I would say that the baseline of that originated from getting behind on your electrolytes early and your and and all that being off and you just not being at a homeostasis point, right? Mm, so your yeah. body's like when you don't have enough electrolytes on board, especially sodium, and you get behind on sodium, you can't just catch back up by taking a bunch of sodium, right? Because it has to absorb and it has to get in the bloodstream and then it has to it has to stabilize in the bloodstream, right? And there has to be a a a level that, you know, your body has, takes a while to get there. So, you know, one of the reasons that when you called me on Monday night from the course, like that, that's one of the reasons that you were low, right? You, you like mentally everything, you were just like out of it and like not feeling the race and like wanting to drop out. And I think that um, that's just, that's stemming from those electrolytes being way off. And then once your electrolytes off, you can't really stomach food that well. And that's why, this conversation at the beginning, we kind of talked about sodium per liter and finding out what your kind of unique sodium dump rate is by getting a test. Cause it's a one-time test. You don't need to get it twice or three times, you go pay for the test one time, you know, your number, and then you can like design your, your race nutrition or hydration strategy around that sodium per liter, you know, dump rate. So I think once you know that it's just going to take a long time. And for you, it took you, you know, a long, long time Cause you didn't feel good right away. Even when you start taking, you know, your electrolytes again, you were like off for a while and it took a while, it took some couple of sleeps and resets. And that's another thing I want to talk about is the sleep factor because you've never really slept that much in two hundreds and this one you did early. It's almost like banking sleep early. So that's another point of recovery. I think is a good discussion point we should table, but talk about in a bit. Well, we're, let's talk about electrolytes right now. But I think that's one thing is the electrolyte factor. I think that's what messed with your stomach. I think that's why your stomach was off. And that's why you couldn't sleep. Now, you've had some gag stuff in the past, right? In in Cocodona last year, when I was pacing you, you were having some of that gag reflex. It was actually and, Moab. Oh, no, that was Moab. Them. That was two yeah. Moabs ago. So yeah. that would have been 2021. 20, 21. Yeah. Um, you were having the same thing. My think, well, I think it's when you, when you're not getting enough, when you haven't got enough sodium per liter probably, and your drink rate was probably too low for your sweat rate. That's my guess. And for you, that's like a symptom. That would be my best guess theory, right? We don't know for sure because it's so, yeah. that's the problem with these races. They're so complex. There's so <laughs> many factors going on all at the same time that it's hard to pinpoint what the actual what's causing that symptom. Right. But we can, we can do a really good, you know, educated guess on it, I guess. So do you know, Jeff, are there studies out there that show, because obviously like when you fall behind, like you were saying, you don't want to pump yourself full with a bunch of sodium because that's like, it's not going to absorb fully and it might sit in your gut and cause more stomach issues. Yeah. So do you know if there's any like data or <clears throat> just anything out there that shows like the best way to try to catch up if you get behind without, without overdoing it. Or I mean, it I think probably the best way was sleeping. sleeping? Right. Okay. Yeah. Right. Cause the body's just like at full rest. And then it's like, and there's something about that sleep that resets, resets issues because I've known multiple people over the years that were kind of, you know, quote unquote pukers in races, right. In hundreds, especially. And a couple of these, uh, one guy in particular, I know always when he got to the, in that cycle of puking constantly, the only way to overcome it was for to take a nap. If he took a nap, even if it was only like 40 minutes, 30 or 40 minutes, it, his gut would reset. He'd wake up and he wouldn't be puking anymore. And he could actually get food down. 
So there's something about the sleeping too. You know, the, the body's such a cool, complex machine that we don't know all the mechanisms that's, that, that are at work, but, but that seems to be one of them that helps, um, which I, obviously it helped you. Um, mm -hmm. And that's probably a good segue into talking about sleep because, you know, the, the sleep factor for you, um, what's interesting is I, I am, I just current, I just started coaching Sarah Ostazewski. Um, oh, nice. And so, you know, she's, she won the women's race and it's her third year at Cocodona and she's done really well every year, but um, this year she banked sleep early. That was her strategy coming into it. And she banked sleep. So she was leading the first day in the women's race and then she banked some sleep and, and the, and the women passed her. Right. And then she knocked her down to like third or fourth, I think, or fifth. I can't remember exactly, but then she slept again in Sedona and and then she didn't sleep from Sedona on. But what, what what's interesting to me is that she was raging after Sedona, meaning she was flying compared to everyone else, right? And there's and so were you. So like, and you guys both bank sleep. That was very interesting data to me, right? That both you know of sleep? experienced the similar. What's that? Do you know how much sleep she got between the two aid stations? I want to say about hour and a half total, or each. Yeah, I think no, no, no together i'm not positive okay. on that i could, don't quote me on that i i'll i'll ask her exactly what it was i can't remember because we've had a coffee shop you know hang out and discuss the race um and because she's local here in flagstaff um so i don't know but i, I want to say it's an hour and a half it might have been two hours but um but and you were what you slept twice right yeah i mean i bet you i got three to four hours of sleep that first night <laughs> Which is crazy because then it banks and then, then you, when you get into the race later, when it matters, you have the juice. Yeah. I think there's, there's something to it, right? Be, because it's hard to sleep later. At least it's harder to sleep because you're more fatigued. You you don't mm -hmm. get as good a quality sleep later when you're more tired and the race is unfolding. So if there's anyone around you, right, if you're up front in the race, you don't really want to sleep because you don't want to lose your place, right? Yeah. Of moving up through the pack or wherever you are, if you're leading or if you're in second or whatever, right? So it's harder for the mind to shut down in the second half of the race. But in the first half of the race, there's no, the race is still unfolding. It's so early in 200s, especially that it doesn't really matter, right? You're not thinking about that. You're just thinking about taking care of yourself. So it's easier to sleep. I feel like the first night. Yeah. And another interesting aspect too is, so like, I, I, ideally I probably should have slept around Sedona again, because even with that three or four hours of sleep, I did start feeling pretty fatigued when I got around Sedona, but being like in the position that I was like, it just worked out so perfectly because every time I like started to get like that, like my eyes started to close and I started like kind of sleep running, like I'd see the next person that I was trying to catch. And then that would like wake me up. It would give me a bunch of adrenaline and then I'd just go fly past them and then look for the next person to pass. But as soon as I passed first place with about a marathon to go, like my mind started to shut down. And like, it's just, it was really interesting to see like how much harder it was for me to keep the momentum going once I got into first place versus being behind everybody and trying to catch them. Like it, totally yeah. shifted and my adrenaline went down like almost instantly once I got to first place. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I think there is something about like, like you were saying, baking that sleep early on, but then utilizing the momentum to try to like catch everybody that pass you while you were sleeping versus being in, in the lead and trying to keep that lead and kind of running scared, basically running scared and really, really tired. Yeah. Right. Cause that's yeah. the hardest thing. Cause I, I tried to do that, you know, in Moab, I tried to go, you know, 40, about 40 hours or 36 hours, 40 hours before I slept. And I, I, I actually had to take dirt naps in that first 40 hours because I was just so tired. Like I just, and you, you're so slow when you're, when you're on, when you're falling asleep on your feet, like you're just yeah. worthless kind of. Yeah. I'm Can guessing you didn't sleep. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, no, go ahead, Mike. What's up? Basically, I, I'm guessing you didn't sleep uh, for the 125. No. Yeah, no. I, I didn't sleep for the 125. You don't have to for you know under 24 or under 30 hours in a race. It's just when it's going to be longer than that. You have to have something, and that's one thing I learned from Moab. I feel like 
that I would do differently, you know, in full disclosure, I signed up for Coca Dona 250 next year. So already. Um, nice. So I just put, I just was like, I'm putting my, I'm putting skin in the game now. Um, <laughs> so I can start thinking about it now. Um, nice. But I think and that was the whole point of doing the 125. I wanted to scout the second half of the course. I've been, I almost did the 250 this year, but I decided to wait a year and focus on hundreds this year. And, and, and when I heard the 125 was happening, I was like, oh, that's perfect. I'll scout, you know, and really like understand. Then I only have to scout the first half of the course before next year. Um, and I don't have to worry about anything up by me. I just have to go down the desert, um, which is ideal in the spring, right? Going chasing, chasing trails in the, in the, in the spring when we have snow up here. So, um, have a whole plan. Um, so, uh, but anyway, I think that's one thing I learned from that experience was that I think I would, I would be a better racer if I slept the first night and probably one other sleep. And then I wouldn't have to sleep the last, like, you know, 70 or 80 miles because, because the race is unfolding. And like you said, that way, especially if you sleep, if you have anyone that's competitive with you, they're going to pass you. Right. And so then you are in that chase mode of like hunting them down later, but I don't want to hunt them down. I don't want to worry about that in the first half. I need to worry about it in the second half when it matters. Yeah. If anything, sorry, I keep cutting you off, Derek. <laughs> this is the last thing I'll say. And then you take over. <laughs> um, if anything that this race taught me is that like before Coca Dona this year, I would have been terrified to take a nap in that first night just because I didn't want to fall two hours or so behind. But like after falling nine to 10 hours behind the first night and then still having time to make that up later in the race, I'd say the biggest thing I've learned from this is like, if you do take a two hour nap that first night, like in a 200 plus mile race, two hours really is not that much time that you need to make up like for the rest of that race. Like, Honestly, it's not, which is, it, it, which is interesting, Mike, because the, a lot of the discussions in on podcasts and cause two hours are so new, right. There's been so many, like the, the, the most recent, like, uh, I guess best practice for the front of the pack has been to run 40 hours before your first sleep. Right. Mm-hmm you know, just under 48 hours. So somewhere in that 36 to 40 hour range of like, before you sleep, mm -hmm. I'm thinking that's wrong. Like based yeah. on like, as this data or as, as racers or, or people who are running multiple 200s now and doing them every year and starting to get more experience in them, like you do. And Sarah has, and like, they're naturally finding that, wow, you know, and it's inadvertent a little bit, right. Yours is inadvertent, right. We didn't even know. Like that was, that was like, you would run way better if you slept the first night, but you just yeah. were kind of forced this year, but she did it as a plan and she ran really strong. Right. So I, I just, I feel like that, that knowledge we have that everyone's been passing around as best practice is probably wrong. And that best practice is evolving. Um, mm -hmm. Boards probably should sleep the first night, bank some sleep, you know, you know, so you need to sleep more in the first 150 miles or 160 miles. And then, and then the race unfolds. And then, like you said, you know, catching people is going to keep you awake if you get in quote race mode. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I'm thinking of, of sleep, obviously like you guys, <laughs> we just discussed it sleeping during the race, but Mike, you finished at what, like 3 AM or something. So yeah, yeah something super early. And then Jeff, what time you finished around? I was like eight 30 in the morning. Yeah. Something like that. And so at that point, I hope Jeff, you appreciate Oh, go ahead. I hope you appreciate that I got up to come see you finish, Jeff. <laughs> I know that's pretty awesome, dude. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about like immediately after the race because you finished like downtown flag. And so it's three in the morning for you, Mike. So like what did you do for your like, I don't know, the first hour or so after finishing? And then Jeff, you want to talk about what you did the first hour or two after as well? Yeah. I mean, mine's pretty easy. Like I went home, um, we got an Airbnb that I Ben said is actually really close to Jeff's house in Flagstaff. Um, but I went there, I got back, I took a shower. I got grossed out at how many blisters I had on my feet. <laughs> I, uh, I never get blisters, but I 
I usually stop to take care of my feet, but you know, after mile 70, I had 10 hours to make up. So I stopped taking care of my feet from that point on. So I cleaned my blisters and then, um, I slept. Honestly, it wasn't that hard for me to wake myself up to come see you finish Jeff, because you know, you know, when we do these races, we sometimes get that like nasty phlegm in our chest and we're just like hacking it up for the next 24 hours. Like I probably fell asleep for an hour or two. And then I woke up like trying not to die because I was choking on my phlegm that was stuck in my throat. So I like woke up in a panic. I was like trying to breathe and coughed up all this nasty crap. And, and, um, I mean, that's the first hour or two after my race, taking care of myself and sleeping for an hour or two before waking up and trying not to die. (laughs) What did you eat or or drink post? Did you do more raw milk and protein recovery or anything, or did you just not want to eat? Um, Honestly, I don't think I ate until around noon that day. Um, I don't know if this if it's the same for both of you, um, specifically you, Jeff, like after Moab, but like after these 200s, it takes a good 24 to 36 hours before like my appetite really comes back. And so the first 24 hours after finishing, I didn't honestly eat that much. I I actually... I usually do some kind of protein recovery drink Mm -hmm. and then like just right after, like, so I have it in my kit, my, Mm -hmm. my change of clothes kit at the finish line. So when you're getting out of your sweaty clothes and like changing into warmer clothes, cause you always get cold. Um, I, I pretty much do, uh, that first. So that just, what that does for me personally, I find when I do that one, I'm getting electrolytes back in, but I'm also getting like, a little bit of easy to digest protein and carbs. So that settles my stomach for me personally. So I find that if I do that, drink some water um, or electrolytes, some kind of like light electrolytes um, and drink some water and that usually within about 40 minutes after the finish, 40 to 60 minutes after the finish, I'm, I'm, I can eat. So like I ate, um, I ate scrambled eggs and bacon, like within inside of an hour of finishing um, and then I went home and did this. I think I ate more eggs as soon as I got home. I showered, I ate eggs. I can't remember. I think that's all I ate was just eggs. And then I slept a little bit and you know, I sleep. I always, I had the same thing hacking cause you're it's, it's Flagstaff. We're at altitude. So we are pushing at altitude, right? We have to go over 9,200 feet. Um, at the very end of the race when you're really fatigued and you just get a little bit of that like gunk, like pulmonary, I think it's a little bit of pulmonary edema, right? Is, is what you're getting that gunk in your lungs. Um, I do find that there's a kind of a cure for that. So I'll give everyone a tip out there that's listening. Um, um, Rocky mountain oils and sodas like doTERRA and a whole bunch of other ones. They all have a breathe ease type, um, essential oil. If you rub that all over, like your, I, like I put it in my beard, on my chest, and I find that if I use that stuff, it clears that gunk up quicker. Um, like usually by evening, by that night, like I take it, took a nap during the day a little bit, and then by that night, I I wasn't hacking anymore. Um, so it clears it up really quickly. So I carry it with me when I go to Hard Rock every year um, because you get it bad at Hard Rock at the end because of pushing that high altitude. So that, that really helps, but that's, it. that's pretty much all I did. And then I just stuck to, I think I drank a bunch of raw milk when I got home, um, as well. You know, I, that's like the perfect recovery drink. Um, so I chugged a bunch of raw milk. Um, I, I ate eggs and then I just ate pretty much protein and fat for about three days. So I pretty much did eggs, protein, a little bit of salad um, a little bit of potatoes, like by day three. Um, but the first like two days, especially the first 48 hours, I'm really strict usually after big races on protein and fat only, and no, no major carbs at all. Um, sometimes I'll eat some carbs in that very, very first meal, but after the race, but that's it. Um, and then I'm pretty strict. And I find that I, I, I wait until my inflammatory phase is over. So like your ankles are back to normal size and everything's like not swollen at all. Um, and then I'll bring carbs back. Um, but 
that that's how I recover personally. And I find, I find that works. I think another a talking point here about recovery that we didn't mention during, during the race for me personally, is I use ketone IQ, there is some research on recovery, um, and taking exogenous ketones. So I definitely use those during a race. Um, I only use them like maybe I can't remember. You might be able to help me remember Derek, cause you're on my helping my wife crew. I think I only did them like three times during the race or something or four, but I, I would do, you know, based on the research that's just coming out on that and more research coming out, I'd probably do it more often, you know, in Bighorn coming up, I'll probably do more ketone IQ, like more often, more like I would Vespa, like every two hours or something. Yeah. I think that's what Michael said too. Like Michael Brandt from um, ketone IQ, I guess HVM and I can never say the name, but I think he said when we did an interview with him to take it like every say you take three gels whenever take one ketone iq shot with that third gel for example so essentially kind of like what you'd be doing um every like hour yeah every couple hour. hours i feel like every two or three hours probably is the appropriate dose and i one of the things too i i would not do they they do recommend taking it before but i'm a high fat low carb athlete so i'm already producing my own ketones so i wouldn't want to override my natural ketone production at the beginning of the race so going into the race, I'm worried about my natural fat kicking on and, and because it, I I've been tested and I know it's really high. So I'm using my natural ketones in the first, say two or three hours of the race. And then as you're burning through and fat burning later in the race, I would start with the ketone IQ drip. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And, um, uh, there there are just a ton of data. Well, not a ton, but there are some data, I should say, saying that like it just helps massively with recovery and then also with brain fatigue as well. So like, if you're taking that mid-race, you can potentially save like mental energy, which could be then translated to physical energy. So you can just have a better overall race. Well, especially if it's a technical race. If you have technical foot footing, like you do at Cocodona, right? You on that course, like there's a lot of rocky stuff and being able to stay focused you know, if you're burning ketones, you're going to be more focused. And that's one of the things that the studies have shown is like when you're burning ketones as a brain fuel, you're way more alert and you're and you and your motor skills are better. Um, surprise. What's really surprising in a, in a hundred K race, one of the studies showed that on ketones versus placebo, that the racers had this, they did an, they did like a, a mental acuity test at the beginning, before the race and after the, after the race or at the end of the race, the people who are using ketones were, had the exact same results as they did before the race. Whereas there was a big cognitive decline in the placebo group. That's really interesting to me as a high fat, low carb OFM athlete, where we're using strategic carbohydrates around effort and volume, but we're still letting our body be in this low level of ketosis, natural ketosis. That's telling me that ketones, our body prefers to burn ketones. And I think that's one of the reasons that we're seeing recovery, such amazing recovery. And I think that's one of the reasons that we're seeing such, uh, you know, across the board when we coach OFM and I've been coaching it now for like almost a decade, and doing it myself almost a decade. And, and, and Mike's been doing it a long time too. And we've been fine tuning and fine tuning and, and messing around and fine tuning. And what we're seeing is an am amazing recovery. That's probably the number one feedback I get from athletes, like is the recovery is off the hook. And, and now that all this key exogenous ketone studies are coming out, it makes sense. Now we're starting to see like, well, ketones are what our body likes to burn. You know, we shouldn't be in ketosis all the time, 24 seven, right. But being in a low level of ketosis all the time, you're burning ketones. And then every once in a while, you're knocking yourself out a little bit, which is a signal to the body that, Hey, we're not in a starvation mode, right. Necessarily. We're in a low level of ketosis, which is a really good fueling source for the brain and, and for recovery for inflammatory. And then all of a sudden we're, we're, we're hovering in and out of ketosis with a little higher carbs. Like we're using them strategically because the studies have shown against keto diets and, and endurance sports that it does mess with bone health. If you're really strict keto in big efforts, right? Long races. Um, uh, we even saw this in, in Mike's blood work when he did the no calorie 24 hour, right? That 
that it does mess with your bone density a bit. And so having those carbohydrates after big efforts to signal to the body that everything's okay and to like not mess with your bone density, but then also, you know, using diet to get into low level ketosis from time to time during the week is really, really good for the overall inflammatory response and recovery and mental acuity and capillaries. Like that was another thing that came out of the research that it helps with capillary. Um, uh, I'm trying to think the exact term. I actually wrote it down in a note in my phone. <laughs> Hold on. I'll tell you what, <laughs> what I wrote, but um, yeah, well, I'll let you guys talk now because I've just been rambling. <laughs> out. Yeah. While you're doing that, um, you know, there's a handful or two of people that I'm helping give some guidance to for OFM with running and training and like without a, like after a big race, I get asked all the time from them. And I'm sure I used to do this all the time with you, Jeff, or maybe I didn't. Like, I think I was actually overly strict when I first started. Um, we but, all are. That's, that's normal. We get a little carb phobic at the beginning, yeah. <laughs> right? When you, everybody does it. Like I have so many athletes come to me that are like, um, quote, keto athletes and, and the keto athletes are always carb phobic and yeah. you have to really pry into like, oh yeah, yeah, I, I eat carbs. Well, what are you eating for carbs? Well, a handful of nuts. It's like, <laughs> that's no, not carbs. It's hardly any carbs. Like, right? so, yeah, I'm like, are you eating fruit? Oh no, well, some berries, a handful of berries, but that's it. And you're like, well, that's part of the problem why you feel so flat after a year of being in keto. Yeah. Like, Don't get me started okay. on that. I'll rant a little bit. But. but yeah, so I like, after a race, they'll come to me and they'll be like, hey, like, I had an amazing race, but like, I could just really use a bunch of pizza and beer like these next two days. And like, I always tell them like, it's, it's your body. It's your choice. If you want pizza and beer, if that's going to make you happy, then do it. But just know like it comes with a cost. Your recovery is going to be that much slower if you choose to do that. So, and, I, Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> it's okay. I was just basically going to say the ones that like decided to move forward with that pizza and beer, like they text me that night and they're like, Oh my gosh, I, regret doing that you're right like i swelled up i felt terrible and then the people that choose not to do it like their recovery goes by that much quicker so well and that's always been a, a coaching point for me is is that i anybody who's messing around with ofm i say you're gonna want to the time you mentally want to cheat is right after a race and big efforts right but that's when the the, the worst time to do it Right. Yeah. So you, you, you really want to think about like, okay, the first, you know, 72 hours or 48 hours, depending on, you know, whether you did a hundred K or a hundred mile or 200 miler, you know, the longer the race, a little longer window right afterwards. So that two or three days afterwards, you're really strict. And then on day four, go have the pizza and beer. Once your inflammatory response has passed right to that event, then go have the pizza and beer and you'll bounce back really quickly. But if you go do it during that window, that first two or three days after the event, you're going to balloon up your knees, mm -hmm. your ankles, you're going to, your gut's going to feel crappy. You're going to feel horrible because that inflammation is going to cause pain, right? In your ankles and your knees, because you're ballooning up, right? There's going to be a bunch of pressure there that you're going to avoid if you're strict right? So it's like a delayed, it's kind of good for like mental discipline too, because it's, it's making you go, okay, I'm going to be disciplined for two or three days. And then I can let it loose a little bit. And that's what I do personally, because in, inevitably we always want to like, if I win, I want to go celebrate with my family. Right. And there, we like to go to Pizza Cleta here. You've been there, Mike, we've done our cheat nights when we've met yeah. up in Flagstaff. <laughs> And go to Dark Sky Brewery and I'll have a nice pale ale and a big pizza with like sourdough crust. And it's one of our favorite pizza places. The kids love it, but we only do it on special occasions. And so it's, it's like a, it's an event when we go do it. Like, Hey, we're, people are coming through town. We're going to meet them there. Or, Hey, dad won his race. We're going to go eat there, but we're not going to eat there. You know, the, I finished on Thursday, so we're not going to go eat there till Saturday or Sunday. Right. So after my inflammatory um, phase has passed. And I mean, I'm sure it's different for you, Jeff, because you have older children. <clears throat> I mean, me and my family, we eat different meals every day now. Like I'm low carb. No one else is like we all do our different sides and stuff. But like, 
I know for me, you, you taught me this uh, concept a year or two ago about like, you know, have your cheat meal three or four days after you finish to reduce the inflammatory response. And like, honestly, as I've progressed in my like nutrition journey, like I, like, for example, when I finished Coca Dona, I had that intent. But by the time that third or fourth day came around, I'm just like, yeah, I'm good. Like, I feel fine. I don't need this cheat meal. <laughs> Yeah. And so. it just depends. Like sometimes you want it and sometimes you don't. There's been times when I never even did it, you know, yeah. like, like we didn't, the, my only cheat meal was wine after, <laughs> after um, the 125, because like, we had family in town and my, my mother and father-in-law in town and they like to enjoy good wine. And it was my uh, 26th wedding anniversary afterwards. My wife and I had gotten a, a, gone to a resort over the weekend so I did really, really good food that whole time. I didn't cheat except that was really my only cheat um, because we ate, we had, you know, we, we had a kitchen at the place we were staying at and there were good restaurants and I went and ate like a $50 steak, you know, and had potatoes. That was my cheat was steak and potatoes. And I wonder how much of that played into you having two big Canyon days uh, so soon after. <laughs> well, yeah, because I didn't cheat. And, and, you know, really, because wine really isn't going to mess with you that much. Right. Um, and, you know, it's not going to make you balloon up or anything. So I recovered really quickly, you know, as far as like inflammation and all that stuff. Um, and I took a couple extra days that I normally wouldn't have because normally I, I I normally take a week off after 100, but mo, 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 or after a 200, I take seven days off. This one, I took five days off and I was running on day six and I was still tight. And part of that was like, I didn't do my normal like mobility work in the first week that I would because I had family in town and it was our anniversary and we were doing stuff down, down in Page Springs near Sedona. And we were like with, we were entertaining my, my mother and father-in-law too. So I didn't do my normal, like, oh, I'm going to spend 15, 20 minutes working on mobility and all that. And so when I got back in the weight room, I kind of just did a, a, a weight session and like my my hip flexor and like so as tightened up from some core work and, and, and that, and so then the next day I had to take a rest day. I was like, well, I can't, I couldn't even run. You know, I, I went and jogged a little, rode my bike and jogged a little bit on day six and lifted and then was super tight and then couldn't run the next day. But then by day eight, I'd worked on mobility and I'd spent a whole day on day seven, like on mobility, that rest day. Like I, I worked on foam rolling the heck out of, of my so as and, hip flexor and legs. And then by the time I woke up on day eight, I'm like, Oh, I think I can run today. And I went and ran really easy and short. Um, you know, I think I only ran like 45 minutes and I did a light. And then I, I did a really, really light strength training session and, and spent a little time in the, in maybe like five minutes in the sauna at the end with some stretching. And then by day nine, I'm feeling good. And then I ran every day until we ran in the Canyon. So I did like, I think eight days in a row or something um, after that and felt good. And I just ran easy every day. I didn't run, I didn't run hard at all. I just ran easy for that week, get to get ready to run in the Canyon. Um, but that kind of just like got me back into it. And now I feel great. Like I have nothing's tight. Um, yeah. I didn't have to get body work this time. I just did my own. Nice. Yeah. So Mike, what kind of um, mobility stuff did you do post race? Did you get, do a massage or anything like that? Or did you go straight to the gym? So, so, uh, I got an Airbnb. We stayed till the finish, um, which was Saturday morning. Um, and then we made the drive back to, to, uh, Northern Utah, but I will throw that in there. Um, I know everybody doesn't have this convenience, but I have some of those, uh, rapid reboot compression boots. And we have a big, uh, 1500 Dodge Ram pickup and, um, like, so I finished Thursday morning, like at 2 AM, my wife, Sarah, like essentially just did a bunch of sleeping after that because she knew that she was going to be the one that had to drive home. <laughs> uh, but I ended up sitting like it's a, from flag, I think it's like an 11 or 12 hour drive to get back home. And like for the majority of that ride, I just sat in the back of the truck and I put my legs up on the seat and I just did those compression boots that whole drive home. And like, I had little to no swelling, which is not 
common for me. Like I, I do clean up my diet after these races, but I do have some kind of swelling after 200 just because of like how much I'm beating my legs up. Uh, Jeff agrees. It looks like, <laughs> yeah, I'm nodding. Yeah. That's like, it, we totally like, even after hundreds, I have swelling, you know, you're going to have swelling. It's just, I used to have it a lot worse before I right. shifted to this diet. Like I had fifth, I had, uh, 22 hundreds under my belt before and 15 years of racing before I switched to this diet. So I had a really good, I had a really good data set of my own N equals one of like what my reaction was to hundred milers on high carb diet. Um, and it's, it's like night and day compared to what I used yeah. to be. Like. No calf definition or anything, right? Like oh yeah. Wonderful. Cankles, you know, you don't even see your ankle bones. I couldn't see the bones in my feet. <laughs> I mean, just yeah. gigantic feet. Um, yeah. it, I mean, to the point where, and really swollen face, like, like it, it was like systemic. Um, mm. my, my wife used to, and brain fog really bad for a week after hundreds, you know, I just chalked it up to being, that's what hundreds did to you. And, you know, my wife always looked at me like, oh my gosh, you do not look good. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so, that was good to have our wives keep us honest. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah, I did those compression boots on the whole drive home. Uh, so we got back late on Saturday night and like that next day on Sunday, I did like a light strength training session for like 25 minutes, like some air squats, banded lateral walks, pushups and stuff like that. Then the day after that on Monday, and then every day that week when I wasn't running, like I was at the gym doing battle ropes, light dumbbell routines, um, single leg squats with like you know, five pounds on the barbell. So very lightweight. <clears throat> so I did a bunch of strength training, um, a bunch of stretching. Um, the an interesting thing with this race is I lost a little bit over 10 pounds, um, which I mean, I would say I lose five to 10 pounds at two hundreds. It's not uncommon, but usually I gain it back within a day or two, but this one stayed off for over a week, almost two weeks. Um, but like the consistent strength training, like the muscle came back and, you know, I'm back up to my normal weight now. And like, I honestly feel I've been experimenting a lot with strength training this past year, not year, sorry, but like during like this year, 2023. So the past few months and like, I, like, I, I honestly feel like, you know, strength training is one of the most important aspects especially for a 200, like later on in the race, when your glutes start shutting down and your hips get weak, like if you can have that strength going into it, like you're going to have that much more efficiency with your, your running form and your stride and everything towards the back end of a 200. It's a yeah, little side tangent. I a hundred percent agree with that. I mean, that's been something I've been preaching for a long time, but, um, I've actually, now that I live at all, almost 7,000 feet, my house is like 6,800 feet. Um, one of the things you have trouble doing at altitude is building muscle. And I'm, and, and I'm early fifties. So you lose muscle mass as you age. And so one of the things I've noticed since I moved here to a couple of years ago is that it's harder for me to build muscle than it used to be. I think it's a combination of getting older and living at altitude, higher altitude now. So um, I've really upped my strength training game um, I joined a local gym. I've always had my own home gym in the garage, but I, I joined a local gym. So I even have more equipment access. It's really close to my house. It's like five minutes from my house. So it's really convenient too. So it's easy for me to pop in there. It's out by some trails on the East side, um, out there, you know, kind of in that section on the way to Walnut Canyon. Um, you kind of run through there after you leave Walnut Canyon, you kind of what weave through on the way to I go under I 40 that trail Campbell Mesa is like really good recovery trails. Cause it's really, really flat. It's just slightly rolling. There's a little bit of, you know, but like a, a six or seven mile run, like you have maybe 200 feet of climbing. Right. So it's a really flat, easy place to go shake out. And so like, it's great because it's, I drive by the gym on the way to the trailhead and the trailhead's literally like three minute drive from the gym and the gym's five minute drive from my house. So like I go by it, go run, go hit the gym, shower, and then I'm back working. And it's a great way, especially in recovery mode, you're looking for flat running anyway. So it's like, I'm just going to go, you know, there's a bunch of options with loops and you can do short loops, long loops, because it's a bunch of clover leaves. 
And so like, I just go out there and cruise and then like hit the gym. And I think the gym I've, I've, I've lifted a lot more this year. I listened to a, a Peter, I think it was a Peter, Peter Atia, the drive podcast. And he was interviewing, I can't think of the guy's name off the top of my head, but a, 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 he's probably a premier researcher on muscle in the U S and um, like, you know, his whole career has been on muscle research. And he was talking about um, how the the background of strength training in the U.S. came from bodybuilding, right? So we've always had this thing that has been beat in, at least it was beat into my head, that you don't do the same muscle group two days in a row. Well, that is true in bodybuilding because you're pumping that muscle group out to its max in a bodybuilding setting, right? So you're like, okay, I'm going to pump my biceps, you know, like, for example, to the max on day on Tuesdays. Well, then you're not going to lift that muscle group again for days. Right. But in, if we're doing lighter strength, like we do a lot, like I always kind of say, Hey, you should do your heaviest session, more, more power lifting sets, you know, where you're descending reps, increasing weight over three sets, three or four sets early in the week, farthest away from your long run. Right. And then as you approach that long run, the other sessions can be more like tough 21, like that we 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 kind of have people do or that kind of dumbbell, full body dumbbell with core work that's working on range of motion, but still under a small load because you're still getting strength from a load, right? So yeah. I think that looking at it that way, and that one was like almost this epiphany for me was like, whoa, we could do like tough 21 almost every day. Because we're not doing heavy unless you're doing a heavy session then you need to make sure you do a really really light session the day after but after that you could pretty much lift every day so i've been playing around with actually doing tough 21 type workouts like daily in some if i have the t- bandwidth or i'm not in a big volume block but if i'm in in lower volume blocks recovery taper stuff like that i'm doing i'm going to the gym almost every day and you've been doing the similar thing right yeah. Mike this year, we've been talking about this back and forth a lot. And I think if we're, if we're designing that program, like I'm talking about, you can handle going to the gym every day. It's just a matter of like, some people don't have the bandwidth in their schedule to go to the gym every single day. You know, I, I luckily have a very convenient location for mine and it's close to me. Um, and I write my own schedule. So I, I have a little bit of a liberal schedule at lunch. Um, so that helps, but for what it's worth. Yeah, I imagine just real quick before you jump in, Mike, that like even if people can't necessarily go to the gym every day, they could do like a like your was the tough 21 session or um, like an ATG session at home with like very minimal equipment and not have to drive anywhere. So like go do your run and then take the 15 to 20 minutes and do that real quick and not have to go on full on like I'm going to drive 30 minutes to the gym, change, blah, 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 and do all that stuff and take two hours. You can just do it very quickly on the tail end or maybe even the front end of a run. Well, and that's what I've done for years like that, because I didn't have the access to a gym. So I had my own home gym with dumbbells, Um, just a very limited. Now I have like adjustable dumbbells, but for years, I only had like three weights, you know, I, you know, I had like tens, twenties and twenty fives or something. And I did, that's where tough 21 kind of came from was like the convenience factor. Cause at the time I was running a graphic design business that was really deadline driven and busy. And I was trying to fit training in and kids and being a dad. So like all of that stuff was, I was, I needed something. That's where 21 minutes came from. Tough 21 was 21 minutes of like timed workout, like where you're getting full body and you could do that at two or three days a week. And I think that's a really good point that you can do it. You can just knock it out at home. I think another auxiliary benefit that I would like to mention, and I'm sure that Mike has experienced this as well. if, If you ever do it right after a run, it's counterintuitive because you're always kind of tight after a run and you, when you get to the truck or whatever, and you're like leaving the trailhead or whatever, but you always like, are like, Oh man, I do. I want to really want to go to the gym. Do I really want to do <laughs> tough 21? Cause this is, I get this all the time with athletes. Like, Oh, I don't want to do it right after a workout. The thing you'll find is you've actually like get to it and do it right. Because you're not doing heavy weight it actually restores your range of motion. So it actually kind of doubles as a mobility routine. And when you get done, like when I walk out of the gym after a tough 21 workout after a run, I'm like, Ooh, I feel great. Like I, everything is my full range of motion is back. I feel completely like restored instead of like worked. 
because sometimes you get done with the run, you're like kind of worked, you know, even if you're, cause especially if you're in recovery mode after a race, you're like, Ooh, you know, a, a, a five or six mile jog on flat rolly trails is kind of a slog with, I like sometimes have to take hike breaks. I'm like, Oh, but then I go do gym work and I feel great. I just do lightweight, you know, for that session, when you're in the recovery mode, you don't want to be doing lifting heavyweight right after a big event. Cause you already have muscle damage. You don't need to do more. You're just trying to like restore blood flow and range of motion and all those little things, but it, it signals there's, you know, one of the things that strength training in that podcast, there's hormonal signaling that happens when you strength train. And I think that's some of the research has shown that, the, that doing a strength training session after big endurance events actually helps you recover. So this is going to go a little bit against what you were just saying, Jeff. <laughs> um, but something that I've personally been tinkering with after Coca Dona that it could be placebo. Um, I don't, I haven't done any studying to see if there's any data that backs this up. Like, obviously, like morning sunlight, there is data that shows that that does help with like lowering cortisol and helping you sleep better and stuff. But like something that I've been doing lately is I've been doing my own variation of tough 21. First thing when I wake up, like between six 30 and seven, I go outside on my back patio and I do tough 21, um, a variation of it outside with the morning sun coming up. And I'm just like, that's an amazing sun. idea. That's really, it smart. feels so good. <laughs> What a way to wake up. Yeah. Yeah. You're getting morning sunlight, you're outside, and then you're doing a workout for, I mean, we, we, we keep saying tough 21. It's my own variation because I do it for about 45 minutes. Um, I essentially double it, but like I've been like implementing instead of squat jumps, I've been doing jump rope, um, instead of planks doing the ab wheel and then just like, you know, my own variation of it. But I really do feel like being outside first thing in the morning, taking my glasses off because my, my glasses transition to sunglasses and just like being out there, letting the sunlight get in my eyes and then doing that kind of workout, I would like to think has been helping my recovery too. I'm sure there is because there is a lot of, st there is a lot of information that's been pushed out there on like getting early sunlight without glasses on, mm -hmm. right? Because our eye, because our glasses actually block that the UV rays that are beneficial and, and that helps with vitamin D absorption, by the way, if you take your glasses off, because if you're wearing sunglasses, you're not really going to get vitamin D absorption very well from mm -hmm. the sun. Um, I even do that sometimes on runs and lunch. If I'm running like during the summer with shirtless, you know, lunch run, I will pop my glasses up on top of my head for at least 20 minutes of the run. Cause I can see okay without my glasses. Cause they're prescription like yours, Mike. And, mm -hmm. um, but I, but it takes a you know a couple of minutes for them really to adjust so I can see trail very well. Um, but I'll do that sometimes just for that benefit. Yeah, I can't see junk without my glasses, so I don't have that as an option. <laughs> so you have to do string training on the patio where it's nice yeah. and concrete, so you don't trip and fall. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, um, as we're going to get close to wrap up here, what do you guys do like um, supplement wise post race? Did you, is there anything specific you did that was abnormal? Like I know, Mike, you you're always posting about creatine that you're taking, but is that just you just follow kind of your normal protocol as far as supplementation? Yeah, I'd say the main supplements I'm taking are creatine, omegas, um, a little bit of vitamin D aside from what I'm getting from the sun um, and then zinc or the main one. And then aside like electrolytes and stuff like that, apple cider vinegar, I've been doing a lot more of that in the morning, but those are the main ones for me. Yeah. And mine are mainly, um, um, I do vitamin D, um, liver pills. Um, mm -hmm. so like K2, getting my K2 from that. Um, and then, uh, I do a bone up supplement, um, from ancestral supplements. Um, and then, uh, what else I do, um, NAC supplement and zinc and, um, electrolytes relight, um, regularly. I mean, that's a regular thing for me. That's a daily thing. So that doesn't really change. And I don't supplement every day. I just supplement, you know, a couple days a week. Um, cause I do a mega dose vitamin D protocol. So I only do vitamin D every two weeks in the summer when I'm getting out in the sun, at lunch. Cause I run at lunch a lot. So I only do every two weeks, but I do it every week during from like labor day to Memorial day in, in the winter, fall and winter and spring. Um, I typically do that mega dose vitamin D every once a week. 
Um, and I've had my levels tested and I'm, and my levels are really, really good with that protocol. It seems to keep me in a really good level. Um, and so that's kind of my, my normal, and I do some other stuff. Like I'll do some whey protein shakes with fruit, frozen fruit and stuff like that in it. Um, you know, from time to time, but that's my main protocol. I just eat good food, like nutrient dense food. Like Mike and I both, we eat tons and tons of animal products. You know, we're definitely an animal based diet, um, with fruit and potatoes. I do, I do more, probably more potatoes than Mike does. He does more fruit than I do. So I, I, I do a few more potatoes regularly. And, and then I still do fruit. I pretty much eat fruit daily. Um, occasionally I might go like real carnivore for a day, but that's rare. It's usually on a rest day or something super, super easy. Um, and, and I think to kind of go back to what Mike was talking about in the, in the taper phase where we used to kind of coach doing a keto reset. I don't really do that much anymore. Um, I, I kind of just eat carnivore and I might go a little lower carb in that two weeks. Cause I know my, my intensity is lower, um, and I'm not doing as much volume in that lat and that taper. So I'm, I'll still eat the same amount of protein a lot. Um, my protein intake doesn't really change, but my, my carb intake might lull a little bit compared to what I would be in a bigger volume block, but I'm still eating fruit daily, um, on those in that, in that, um, phase. So, so you guys both mentioned zinc. Why are you both taking zinc? I'm curious about that. Well, it does help with like fight off um, viral loads if you come across them. So that's one of the benefits. I have a list yeah, I mean, of I, I'd have to look it up for you exactly what those are. Yeah. And I mean, after a big effort like that, your immune system is going to be knocked down a little bit too. <laughs> yeah. Big time. Yeah. 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 I'll, I'll take actually, if, if, if anybody's fighting, I kind of have a, a antiviral over the counter protocol with supplements it's a long list. I can't, I, I could, I could probably rattle it off, but actually I probably have a list somewhere on my phone of all the supplements. It's a long list, but I'll do that as an antiviral protocol. Whenever someone, I know I've come across someone who's sick and, and been in contact with them, or if someone in my household, like my a kid is sick or fighting something mm -hmm. and I'm getting close to a race, especially, um, I'm going to be on that protocol because it's just a natural over the counter protocol to help boost your immune system. You know, it's like cursed and zinc, like, like cursed and drives zinc into the cell. Um, there's like a synergistic relationship. There's NAC. I take an NAD supplement. Um, uh, liver. Do you do, do you do clear nasal spray? Yep. That's another one. Yep. You know, so it's, yeah. it's, it's like X starts with an X that yeah. one. Yeah. So I'll do, yeah, I'll do that. I have that, you know, I'll, I'll be doing the nasal spray so you don't get viral replication in the nasal passage and throat, um, or knock it down, um, that kind of stuff. So I'll do those kind of protocols. If I know I've come in contact with some, sometimes I'll do it as a prophylaxis too. If you've done a big block and you're coming towards an A race and you're in the taper, you know, you don't know when you're going to the grocery store, if you're coming across someone who's sick and just walk through <laughs> the cough you know, or something. And, um, so I like, I will, I will be a little more proactive as a prophylaxis in, in the last two weeks using that protocol, um, just to, as an insurance policy, I guess. And it's also helping boost your immune system right yep. before the race, because you're going to knock yep. it down in these long races, especially hundred plus. Yeah, there's no worse feeling than showing up to a race ready to crush it, but you caught some kind of sickness. <laughs> right before you did all this work and yeah. tapered <laughs> done all your strength training mobility and then you show yeah. up and, oh my gosh i don't feel it, good yeah it seems it's like a horrible. cheap insurance policy basically if you're going to put in months and months and months of work and time and money why not just spend the extra few dollars to make sure you're not sick showing up to the start line yeah even if it only gives you a two or three percent bump in your immune system but it, anything that might just like ward it off a little is worth it it's not going to hurt you right and you can afford 10 bucks to get those things, 20 yeah. bucks maybe. Well, with that many supplements, if you're buying them outright, it's going to be a couple hundred bucks probably worth of supplements. <laughs> I mean, it's a long list, but, but once you have them, it's, it's there, you know, you're going to, you're going to be right. able to take them for a long, long time. Cause you're not taking them every day. So it lasts a long, long time. Once you, once you've purchased all of them, it's just the initial purchase might be a little expensive, but <laughs>
Did, did you guys um increase any organ meats at all post like i know we only have a few minutes because you guys got to go but um did you like uptake anything or did you up your intake of organ meats at all or supplements i mean I, me personally i probably do liver i either do like two ounces of liver a day like in my normal day-to-day -day, or i'll do like three to four ounces every other day um, but I would say like for a week and a half, it's really interesting actually. So after the Arizona trail, um, you know, that pizza place that Jeff referred to earlier, I stopped there and had uh, lunch with Jeff and Jen and they, um, I, I was having issues with my vision and, uh, before that I never touched the liver because I just, it disgusted me. And, and Jen kept telling me just to go home and eat some liver that that would help with my vision issues. And like, I want to say either the first time or the, the second time at the most, like after eating liver, like my eyesight restored itself. And I noticed that after Coca-Dona, I had issues with my vision too. And so, yeah, so like I upped my liver intake to about three to four ounces a day for a full week, week and a half, my vision like restored itself again. And so yeah, I did up my liver intake a little bit for specifically for my vision after Coca-Dona. I took a lot of liver, liver supplements afterwards, but I didn't, I didn't eat a lot of liver. Um, like I need to, cause I have a half a cow in my freezer. So like I, I have a bunch, I have big chunks of liver. I need to like thaw it out because most of the time I let my wife cook it, but I need to do what Mike does personally. I think that's a really good way to do it is just have some thawed out already and you can kind of just slice off of like two ounces and just have it as almost think of it as like a supplement because it really is a superfood um compared to anything else it's so nutrient dense and it gets you so many trace other vitamins and minerals like it, it blows pretty much anything else out of the water as far as from a nutrient density perspective so learning how to make it and mike's done a really good job with doing it in his air fryer he shared a couple of recipes with me um, cause my wife does it as a pate. So it, so there's a lot of prep, but once you have it, it's done, it's a big batch and we will eat it over three or four days or a week, you know, and keep putting it in the fridge or use it with like, you know, grain free crackers or something or something like that. But, um, I think eat, figuring out how to eat it appropriately, like, like where it's actually whole is it probably even better because it's more convenient and it's easier to do, especially with an air fryer. So I, I think I need to. this week i'm gonna i'm gonna go find some in my freezer right after this call's over and get it thawed out and i'm gonna start eating like two ounces a day i mean if you source it right and you just add salt and butter to it like i don't think the taste like my first time and you don't have to eat a ton right you don't have to eat it's a small no. small portion it's like yeah. think of it like a supplement right two ounces yeah and i mean like my first time trying it, i bought it from walmart like it was nasty. I, I had to add salt, butter. I added steak sauce. I added cheese. Like it was terrible. But then my second time I bought the, um, it's like the thousand Hills brand from like natural grocers and whole Which foods. Is good. Yeah. Like I legit just like the next day I tried that and I just had to add salt and butter. Like it tasted so much better. It, it's crazy. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. Good source matters because the liver <laughs> collects a bunch of stuff right so if yeah. it's not a healthy cow if they've had it like really on a lot of grain it's not going to be a healthy cow so mm -hmm. if you can get a grass-fed source that's ideal yeah and it's like seven bucks for a package at natural grocers and like with how little you actually eat that seven dollar package will last you a week and a half like it's not that right. much money to get good quality liver yeah yeah and then if people are really turned off by it kind of like a gateway food or supplement if you want to call it that would just be the liver capsules like dry liver supplement mm -hmm. like you don't taste it and like i i'm definitely a fan of like eating it fresh um well like like an actual piece of liver but like if you don't want to do that maybe just start with some supplementation like it's more expensive but it definitely has a lot of benefits too it's just yeah that's what i mean that's what i recommend to people if they don't want to eat it mm -hmm. you know then get sup then supplement and that's why i supplement because we don't always make it we're not making it every single week. Usually it's, you know, every once in a while. And, but I feel like from a training perspective, after Mike saying, oh yeah, like thinking of like two ounces every day or three or four ounces every other day, that's a really good strategy because you're getting the real source, not, not the, 
the capsule source. Mm-hmm. So I need to do that. I'm, I'm, I'm down. I'm, I'm going to, I'm seriously going to go out to my freezer after this in my garage. <laughs> nice. It's good to hear that. I have helped you with something <laughs> <laughs> since you've helped me with so much. <laughs> And two, I, I do got to go. I have a call, but real quick, another thing that you can do too is Force of Nature has that uh, ancestral blend where it's like ground beef with a little bit of heart and a little bit of liver in it. And that's a good way too, to get used to the taste. Yeah. Great way to do it. I think Derek turned me on to that for the first time. I didn't even know that existed. He had said, oh yeah, just go to the freezer section, natural groceries and look for it. And I was like, totally right there. And it's like, got it mixed in. And, and if you make it like a burger, it's like, that's the best way. If you don't like the taste of liver, that's probably one of the best ways to eat, get real liver. Plus, yeah. plus you're getting some heart too in there. And so you're going to get the, the nutrient profile of heart as well. Yeah. You don't even taste perfect. it. So it's perfect. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, let's wrap it up then. Mike, you got to go. We all got to go. So um, that was fun to chat about recovery and uh, winning those two longer events. It was cool. Yeah. Thanks yeah. guys. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Congrats again, Jeff. Yeah. Congrats, Mike.